Hey, I'm George Hamilton, joined by my uh, colleague, Eric uh, Chabelle. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about know, shift left observability. So we've kind of heard this, and I know Eric's done quite a few blogs on this topic. I would recommend you check them out. Uh, and really, I think in general, we'll look at the observability space. And I think that there's this, we really need to start focusing more on how we make you know engineers more productive in the cloud native world. I think a lot of, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about um, trying to get costs under control, trying to get data under control. And those are still really important topics. But I think uh, anybody tuning into this webinar probably has seen some engineer burnout with the amount of work is required now in a, in a very complex microservices architecture. So Eric and I are gonna talk a lot about that now. So the first thing I just wanted to introduce a little bit is just, just to, to level set a little bit is just the background and the evolution of the monitoring market. And we kind of joked recently um, during the an interview process with a candidate at Chronosphere, we asked them, you know, what word, if you could just completely strike it from the lexicon of the observability market space, what would it be? And they struggled for a second. Then they said, you know what, observability. And we're like, that's a great answer. Um, it's, it's, it's almost lost all its meaning because it's just slapped as a label onto everything now. And it's really even, it's pretty difficult for people to even understand what observability really means. And, but I think we're at an inflection point. And when you think back a few years, and I'm old enough to remember the, the on-premises data center world, and even before that, when I was an analyst covering IT management software. And, you know, back then you had the big four of, you know, CA, HP, IBM, BMC, that pretty much that was the monitoring world of owned by ops. And the basic thing there was, you know, is it up or is it down? That was it, or red, yellow, green. Um, and, you know, it was, um, you had monolithic applications running on a handful of hosts uh, in a data center. So things were fairly simple. As we moved into the cloud era where things started to get, you know, X as a service, everything based on virtual machines. Um, now you have tens, maybe dozens of services running on hundreds to thousands of virtual machines and things evolved and you had new vendors that emerged into that space that kind of filled in the blanks of what the uh, the old big four used to or tried to do. And it really it evolved from, is it up or down? Now you needed to know, is it performing right? Is it meeting whatever KPIs we have spelled out? Uh, is it meeting SLAs and SLOs? So it was much more of, of a performance and of course cost with FinOps becoming a whole discipline. Um, now we're at a really an interesting point where now it's, it's not just dozens of applications running on hundreds of thousands of VMs. It's now literally thousands of microservices running on millions of containers in some environments. And now the, the question is, what is my customer and end user experience like? How do I know that? And things are so much more complicated now. So we're going to dig, dig into that a little bit. So first, you know, we understand we, we've adopted cloud native for a lot of good reasons, right? We want speed, we want efficiency, we want to innovate faster, all of the things that you hear, all the marketing speak, and gaining a competitive edge, right? But now everyone's environment is much more complex than it's ever been. Infrastructure is running on containers, they're ephemeral, they scale dynamically, um, and they have very unique operational challenges. On top of that, your applications are all built on microservices, which have many more interdependencies. And crucially, there's likely no single person in your environment who knows how all of this fits together. Yeah. And even though this is giving you a lot of agility, being able to do things quickly and dynamically, when there's an incident that pops up, an example would be like an order processing app, a shopping cart app, whatever, on your e comm site, it's nearly impossible to figure out where to go to fix that problem. And this is despite the fact that you have access probably to more data than ever because each container microservice is emitting as many metrics as a single monolithic VM-based application used to. So as a result, on-call developers who, you know, maybe aren't familiar with the scale complexity, they don't even know where to begin when something comes up. And you can see there's so much data to have to sift through. And engineers from all parts of the organization get pulled away from their day job to help troubleshoot it. Your central observability team is trying to support the engineers, but they're usually dealing with other problems like dashboards that are slow or won't load, or queries timing out, or you know the availability of, of, of the observability system itself um, is a problem. So you could be, your app goes down, and your observability system is hosted on the same cloud or the same region. Now, all of a sudden, I have no app and I have no visibility into it at all. I'm blind. 
Um, the majority of the time of the cot is, is spent maintaining, troubleshooting the observability system itself. Um, you know, and then the business owners, of course, get upset. You know, they're looking for answers, um, you know, and they want it immediately. And more importantly, your customers are getting pretty annoyed or you have something that affects revenue. Um, so this is a huge impact on your technical team, um, on your customers, on your business. You, you can lose revenue, customer churn, all those things. Um, and of course, you're spending a lot of time with engineering toil. The engineers are doing a lot of work just trying to keep the lights on. Of course, this is an age-old problem and the costs get higher. Um, and so, you know, you know, how'd we get here? Observability was supposed to help with a lot of this. Um, you know, it, it, it and but the problem is is like when you started using like APM, or maybe you're just getting started with a Prometheus-based solution, the costs of your observability solution were probably in line with the value that you were receiving. But now this cloud native problem is starting to throw this equation out of whack. Um, the data volume are driving up your cost substantially and you're not fixing problems faster. In fact, it's just taking longer. Um, more data isn't always better. It, it can slow you down. It makes it harder to find what's important. Uh, it hurts performance. And so you're actually driving down the value that you're getting from your observability platform. And some interesting stats to back that up, like ESG did a survey in 2021 71% of companies they interviewed um, were at least concerned about the growth of their observa of their observability data. And, you know, and PagerDuty found that almost 70% of companies actually saw an increase in customer-facing incidents in the past 12 months. So what it boils down to is kind of two primary things, right? And one is just the first one is the volume and complexity of data is overwhelming. And two, legacy application performance monitoring some cloud monitoring solutions, DIY Prometheus, whichever your approach is, the available tools today really aren't supporting the workflows that uh, that are emerging as organizations build and support a microservices-based architecture. Um, so let's drill into each of these things. Uh, Eric, we'll start with you and talking about first the volume and complexity issue. Yeah, it's a really nice uh, image here where it shows you that it feels like the water's on your lips, right? It's It's you're getting buried in what's going on here. And uh, the, the idea is that you don't mind uh, spending more money. You don't mind uh, having more data. You don't mind more tools if all that stuff would uh, result in better outcomes, which it's not doing. And uh, it's about time that we start getting a little bit more uh, of our time back. Uh, we want to have uh, more focus and uh, we'd like to see a little bit more uh, uh, dev uh, than the ops, right? So all our engineers need to be back on engineering tasks and not tracking down in that great big pile of data what's going on. Um, if we go to the next one, you'll see a, a quote that I just uh, uh, saw on a, a Reddit thread not too long ago, probably about two weeks ago, was somebody was asking about some tracing information, uh, who's using tracing, what's it like? And the very first response was <laughs> pretty classic right here, right? Like he's basically said, I can't even get devs to care about the metrics, let alone traces. So why, why, why dig any deeper than that, right? And I mean, this, this is a real struggle that's going on. There's quite a few organizations out there that are just barely keeping their, their heads above water. It's, it's that simple. Um, you just don't have the, the time uh, to invest in, in learning this stuff. You got such pressures on the engineering and the developers already that the more you pull them away, the more stress they have, which leads to that burnout we talked about at the beginning. Um, and to the next one, you'll see here uh, a bit of a frame around uh, the impact on the data volume through those last two phases we talked about in one of the first slides there so from the 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 version two where you see the the vms and stuff you're pretty much dealing with a a single kind of service or one-to-one -one connections a little bit more monolithic and stuff on a virtual machine everything seems fairly controllable with with apm kind of you know application performance monitoring tools um, but then it, all of a sudden this cloud native explodes on the scene and it's 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 a lot of reasons, but each one of these phases from the business to the application to the architecture is just a multitude of more. And it's not something you're 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 able to control either, because remember, cloud native environments are based on Kubernetes. Kubernetes is basically you uh, defining how you want uh, your system to appear and you let the system sort out how to do that, which means it scales dynamically, it expands dynamically as necessary. And uh, not not always uh, within the confines of what your budget might be or what your monitoring capabilities were, were expecting as far as the flood of data that comes in. 
which also results in, in, in a lot of these large bills, right? Because it's unexpected expansions and you don't have the control mechanisms in place. Also, the reason you see the focus on FinOps, financial operations roles, so that somebody owns uh, the expense aspect of what's going on and it's not just sprinkled around the organization that everybody's making decisions on their own. Uh, you see in the next one, another aspect of, of being in these kind of cloud native in the next slide, being in the uh, cloud native environments where things are dynamic and expanding, say your developers and your engineers are releasing something new, right? And uh, they roll out some kind of a, a service or whatever with a few data points in there. Uh, not a big problem when you're on the virtual machine based kind of uh, uh, environments we were talking about, but in a cloud native environment, when it starts expanding and scaling automatically, this runs into some huge cardinality issues where you see some numbers there at the bottom that are not unrealistic at all uh, about how fast things can explode. And if you don't have uh, observability mechanisms in place or the ability just to, to, to predict what's going on with this kind of stuff, you're getting the bill at the end to find out what happened. And uh, that's not really the way you wanna, you wanna explode your budgets, right? That's, it's not hard to do and it's very innocent. It's not that people are just ignorant. It's just that you just didn't expect the, the, the scaling that happens because of the popularity of the service you're using, for example. And in the next slide, we have a really good example of uh, something you do, I, it's in the speaker notes. So if you get a look at the slides, there's a link to where this came from, but somebody did an experiment on the, the amount of data that's generated when you're just doing very simple observability on a single cluster with four nodes, you have a front end app, you have a back end thing, you're, you're, you're collecting uh, logs, metrics, and some tracing across the service, and you're generating some front end activity just by ping in a website. So it's really simplistic and probably not very realistic in the sense of the amount of data that a normal application or service might generate. But let's just say, you know, and it's, it's well detailed in the, in the article. But the bottom line here is that if you have to keep this for 30 days, you're looking at almost half a terabyte on this one setup that's being generated. And uh, most organizations uh, around the world currently are keeping their metrics and uh, observability data for a minimum of 13 months. So you can imagine if you're running you know, thousands of these or millions of these things, the amount of data that you could be forced to pay for that you're trying to store and to hold on for such a long time. Uh, it's, it's really, really shocking, right? I mean, that little kid's face says it all. And then uh, the, the next slide, you see that uh, the, the tool sprawl also means that in the workflows become very disjunct or disjointed from what's going on in your organization. So the idea being that there's a business process or a business value going on here in your organization. And when you're tracing, it becomes a technical uh, uh, story when you're troubleshooting, remediating and trying to jump around to these different tools uh, to get to the root cause of, of what's happening and to get that remediation in place as fast as possible. Uh, basically, you just uh, end up over time uh, generating an, an infrastructure environment for your observability that's, that's technological bandages, right? It's like putting band-aids on a leaking uh, a leaking dam. It's just is not the way you're going to, you know, and it's building up stress. The people that are on call are having a hard time sorting stuff out, having to bring more people in, just like George said. And uh, it's it's a pretty frustrating environment for, for anybody. Uh, we, we know, uh, both George and I know someone here uh, that we've... Uh, uh, been in contact with it is burned out six times six times in these kind of roles you know i mean what you get a little uh get a get a little helpless when you don't even know what your next job is going to be when you think you're stepping into the same stuff again you know it's not the way to go yeah it's actually kind of been helpful to chronosphere because we've been able to hire some really talented technical people to, to join <laughs> who were burned out as sres because you know they're tired of missing kids birthday parties going in on nights and weekends and um yeah. and just this reliance on power users in an environment has become a really big acute problem where newer engineers it's hard to get them to be productive and they end up escalating things to a, a tier one power user who then becomes like indispensable so one they get burned out and they're miserable and then they leave and then you've got a gaping hole in your organization so that's a really really good point um you know all these band-aids were we're trying to you know, apply to catch up to cloud native, it really hurts the teams. And so, but a question is, you know, how did we kind of get here? And so development generally used to be fairly simple. Ownership was fairly simple. And of course the ops team could kind of, you know, it was, they were segmented, right? So, you know, a team would basically own an application from top to bottom. Um, and, you know, 
this is when we even moving into cloud, this was still primarily the case. The applications were kind of lifted and shifted. And again, your teams would own a single base of code for an application from top to bottom. And it was a fairly simple thing. There's no such thing exists in the cloud native world. Applications are not a monolith. There isn't a team that owns an app. They're all on the fly amalgamation of independently owned and operated microservices. So you've got these two pizza teams, each owning their microservice, but they rely on, depend on interconnected microservices owned by other teams. And so increasingly organizations are setting up their dev teams in this manner to map to this new reality. And of course, this maps to how we used to monitor these things. And so monitoring in the cloud world was fairly straightforward in the old IT world um, where you know ops kind of owned everything. So you wrote your application, deployed it, and okay, here's the operations, here's the monitoring that goes with it. So each application would roll up to an APM tool, you had an infrastructure going up to infrastructure monitoring and then roll that up to a, a mom or a manager of managers and ops would own it. Again, pretty simplistic and teams were organized around that. Today, things are a lot more democratic, which is nice. Um, you can move faster, you have all this agility. And these two pizza teams own their microservices, but the problem is, is they can very easily create their own tooling and their own dashboards to monitor their individual service. And so this is a very bottoms up approach. And again, it's nice because everybody can create a dashboard. Um, it's like Oprah Winfrey, and you get a dashboard and you get a dashboard. Um, you can have a unique dashboard or monitors for every microservice. Engineers can copy a dashboard, tweak it only slightly, and it gets to the point where you have thousands of dashboards. And again, only the power users end up knowing where anything is. Um, it's nearly impossible to find the right data. And so you know, entropy has become this huge issue in a lot of in large scaling environments. And it makes finding the right data nearly impossible. Troubleshooting times are longer. And in fact, I know there, there are APM tools that actually include features that will scan your environment for underutilized dashboards and will delete them according to policy. It's kind of like trying to clean up their own mess. Um, and so, you know, here's where we've kind of ended up, <clears throat> you know, and where do we need to go? We have dashboard and tool sprawl, which is still a very persistent problem. Um, data is also locked in proprietary formats still. <clears throat> and the the operational, the APM tools, some observability tools control what data you can collect and put it in the context of their tooling only. Um, you also, you know, have over reliance, like as I mentioned, on the power users, a lot of toil, and you can't spend time adding new value adding features to things. And <clears throat> again, you have a reliability issue that comes up as one of the number one things that we've heard from our own customers is the reliability of their platform. When they, when the observability system is down at the same time as the app that they're flying blind, and they've said that that is a huge issue for them. It costs them money, it costs them engineering time. Um, so again, troubleshooting times are longer. Engineers get burned out, um, and your end users are very unhappy with the application. So what you really need to have is much more centralized control with some flexibility. So this bottoms up. Anybody can create a dashboard, and you have this entropy issue. Uh, you don't want to have the heavy-handed top-down world that we used to have when ops owned everything, but you want to have a system where users can kind of curate what's important about an application, about a microservice, and be able to share that information broadly through the organization, uh, while the, the central observability team can wrap some guidelines and, and guidance around that. So you have this balance of let's do what's best for the organization, but give you the flexibility to have what you need. It should be 100% open source compatible. I think we're running into um, a way where we're seeing a lot of vendors pay lip service to open source, but they add proprietary hooks to it, which a lot of traditional legacy IT vendors have always tried to do. Um, you want to make sure that we, we really should be 100% open source compatible and that the service owners can choose the data. And again, with guidelines, um, but you want them to be able to collect what they want and not collect what they don't want and have control over shaping that data so that they have the right data that the helps them troubleshoot and giving those engineering teams, empower them um, and take them away from some of the toil, um, make on-call shifts suck less and, and have them focus more on doing important value adding things. And it should you should have better reliability of your observability platform than your production systems. And all of that will lead to improving all those things that we just said were the were the were the trouble. 
And George, that's that's huge, right? Giving people the knobs and the dials to 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 tone down their information. You're about to show them here in a second. Yeah. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do, right, this cloud native complexity is overwhelming. Your cost to value ratio gets totally out of whack. And what we're trying to show is that Chronosphere kind of gets you back in control of that. Um, so here's kind of where we end up, you know, back to this layer cake, right? This is exactly what we've designed to solve, right? And we'll show you how in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, but you should be able to get these costs under control improve your visibility uh, and be able to find the right data to solve a problem. So we kind of swing that cost value equation back into your favor. So you're collecting all of the same data, but it's aggregated and transformed. Like I said, we shape that data so that you actually only have the data that gives you actionable insight into something that's actually usable for your developers, also while being much more efficient, much more cost effective. So improve things like MTDD, MTDR, um, you get happier customers. Um, and again, you can still kind of have um, this democratization um, in observability, but reduce toil and keep your engineers, you know, focused on, in, you know, on innovation and your observability costs will actually go down. And what's, what's really interesting here too, is you're seeing uh, uh, that the the, the narrowing of the focus leads to uh, you're being led through the solution space, right? The investigation does not include jumping around to a bunch of different tools. It's taking you from where you started with the the, the actual monitoring alert down into the, the problems you're looking for. That's that's really a, a big a big difference from what you're usually seeing in the in the second generation stuff. Yeah, and it's about putting data in context and socializing all of that kind of tribal knowledge that's in the head of your power users and being able to socialize that to the rest of the organization so that less experienced engineers do not have to escalate as frequently, that they can actually go in and resolve issues much, much faster. And so how do we do that? And Eric, I'll let you kind of walk through some of the Chronosphere platform and some of the specifics, and we'll show you two things on how we shape data to reduce the data volume without uh, negatively impacting your key metrics and also how we support engineer workflows and map to your organization. Yeah, so this is a, a, a high level overview, but but keep in mind here the things that are really interesting, right? How you ingest uh, your data, uh, keeping that open source and, 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 and open standards, right? That's that's the big key right there. Um, you're also looking at the amount of storage you're going to use. You're also looking at the dashboarding you're creating, the alerting. All this stuff is super important, right? You have to have those pieces. But what you see here is a, a, a metrics events and traces being uh, ingested uh, using uh, open standards. Um, things like PromQL and, and things like that are used around the, uh, the dashboarding and the alerting uh, queries. Um, we have uh, the first thing that happens after collecting that data is you have a control plane. This control plane is what puts the, the, the dials and the buttons in your hands to decide, okay, I'm getting a lot of information coming in. And if you look in a, a cloud native world, uh, a, a lot of people are involved with uh, like marketplaces where you just order things by pushing buttons to create your infrastructure and your environment. And you start plugging into to the ingestive uh, uh, stuff you spun up. And it turns out that they by default turned on quite a few things you're not really interested in, right? So maybe there's a whole pile of logs coming in that is not really so super exciting for, for what you want to know in, in you know monitoring what your specific uh, two pizza team is doing. Um, so you have the ability to, to you know, use roll-up rules or drop rules, uh, uh, aggregate stuff. You can decide what you want to keep. And, and the nice thing is that you're doing that at ingestion time, which means it hasn't been stored yet, which is immediately reducing the cost. Uh, I think one of the numbers we like to quote a lot of the times is about 50% of this data is on average what we save uh, uh, for any customers that uh, uh, go onto this platform, just because they've never realized they've never had the option or the ability to easily do that. So being able to take the control plane and to, to downsample stuff and to, to, to get back control of your own data for your specific needs, to put it into your dashboards, um, that, that's, that's superpower here, right? That, that puts, puts you into the superpower space. Um, the reliability and, and the performance of this stuff, everybody's a single tenant user of this. Um, uh, the back end there, the data store is, is, is based on the, the M3 uh, at Uber scale, right? Our, our founders uh, uh, both uh, were involved with developing that at, uh, at Uber. Um, 
and you see the the whole idea of this platform that the, the contextualizing this stuff per user is that it's based on these principles you want to know as fast as possible when something's going wrong you want to be able to uh, triage the problem and within those two steps you want to remediate so as fast as possible get to a solution but you don't want to lose the information or have the ability not have the ability later to be able to do the root, root cause analysis and be able to deeply understand what went wrong so it doesn't happen again and that's the path you're being led down. That's what drives every conceptual view that a user is doing. I need enough data to get the right notifications. I need enough data to triage. I need to be led through that process without having to jump around to a bunch of different tools or dashboards. And then I need to also have the ability to drill down far enough, uh, maybe not for me as the user that got, you know, was on call, but to, to know the right person to give that information to so they can do the root cause analysis and decide what went wrong. Um, yeah, next uh, next slide. Oh, right there, yeah. yeah um, sorry. <laughs> so what you see is, uh, uh, this is kind of a higher level overview here where you see the ingestion on the front end and you see a couple, of, if, you, if you're a little bit at home in the, the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, you'll see some uh, open source projects that we uh, consider the standards for ingesting in, in the open source world, right? So you have uh, Prometheus, you have uh, Open Telemetry, uh, Jaeger, uh, things like that. Um, these things are, are, are providing an open standard for uh, ingesting our metrics through a Corona Sphere collector. So anybody that started out already with the, the you know, trying to build their own infrastructure on a small scale and finding it hard to do the bigger it gets in the open, you know, that's used open standards, it's almost a, 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 an easy a, a migration uh, process of pointing to the new Corona Sphere collector with the same stuff you were ingesting before. So you see a large amount of data is coming in because nothing's changed. You're still ingesting the same amount of stuff you were before. But when you hit the control plane, you now have the ability to do a couple of things. You can, uh, uh, you know, roll up rules, drop rules, uh, aggregation, decide which data is important to you for your information, your dashboard, your, your solution space. And uh, you can also uh, create uh, rate limits uh, to be able to be sure that you never, you know, have a team explode out of what's going on. And you can set alerts on that also. We have a pretty neat example we show uh, of stuff like that. And then finally, after that, it gets persisted into the back end. So that's really uh, super important to, uh, to understand that you have that ability at the front end to control it. And putting the control back in your hands is huge, right? That's just super huge. Yeah, true. And I, I'm going to go back to this for a second because I clicked through <laughs> incorrectly last time. I just want to hammer home some points that Eric made that were really important. Our own sir, our own data points around our existing customers was that they spend about 50% less time troubleshooting. So they, they're getting to remediation much faster. On average, Chronosphere customers reduce their data volume almost 50%. And now some, that's on average, some have reduced much more than that. Uh, we've had some customers say 70, 80%, um, which means they were really inefficient before, but they have the remarkable change with, and of course they've, and again, that's in, with improvements in their troubleshooting with less data, because if they're, they're not having to sift through a bunch of data that doesn't matter. Um, hugely scalable platform, as Eric mentioned. And the last thing I point out is the, the four nines is historically what we've delivered. It's one thing to promise an SLA. It's another thing to deliver on it. And a lot of vendors promise SLAs and great, you get a credit at the end of the month for the downtime. That didn't help you with the problem that impacted your customers. So it, you look always at, you, know, you can go on the, the vendor's websites and they will publicly post any issues that come up. And I think you'll find the majority of the time they're around 99.5%. You know, and that's a lot of time each month. That's a difference between 99.5 and four nines. And that's, we've historically delivered that four nines for our customers. So the reliability, again, is a, a huge thing. That's feedback directly from our own customers. And so another thing I just wanted to bring up. So did, we've talked about the data volume piece and being able to get, you know, get to the right data and and be much more efficient and reduce your costs. And of course, we don't charge for ingest. We're only charged for persistent storage. So that's a very disruptive in the market today um, because most vendors will charge for ingest in addition to storage and don't really have the mechanisms to filter out a lot of stuff that you don't need either because their, in, their incentive is for you to store as much data as possible. They will make more money when you do. Um, so again, that's a, a huge point. But secondly, we also recently announced at KubeCon 
a, a new release of our software that really gets directly to the engineer burnout problem in their productivity. And a key new features that we announced are called workspaces and collections. And so using workspaces and collections, customers can actually align their organizations in their workflows within Chronosphere. So you can think of workspaces as kind of your views into the environment. It really orients you as an engineer so you can work more effectively. Your workspace can be global, which is a view of the entire system, or at the team level, which are the services are relevant just to the team. The primary view is the team view. And that's what we're showing in this image here. So this is actually the infrastructure team. And this is their view um, that includes all of their collections. So what's a collection? So a collection is an organizational construct where teams can actually store everything that's relevant to a service. So you can think of a collection as representing a service. And so collections let the expert on the team who knows build the default view of a microservice. And then that view is shared with everyone else in the organization. Because I have a global view, I can see everybody else's, all the other teams and all their collections and what's what they've curated. But it puts the power in the engineers to curate all of the things, all of the dashboards, monitors, all the other artifacts that are associated with a microservice and curate them into a collection and then it give everybody in the organization a view into that so that now you have a uh, engineer it puts data in context for engineering teams so engineer you know so workspaces and collections excuse me workspaces and collections work together to provide context for engineering teams so engineers can much more quickly navigate to the data that's relevant to an issue so again less reliance on power users and also freeing up those power users to do more innovative value adding things than just coming to the rescue of a less experienced engineer who can't find the data that's associated with the problem. And so in general, Chronosphere, the value that we're delivering here is again, being able to control and shape your data that Eric really went through in a lot of detail. The reliability of the platform being more reliable than your production infrastructure. And again, workspaces and collections, putting the right data in the right context at the right time so that you can resolve issues faster, you faster detection, faster triage, more effective root cause. And of course, you know, the customer success organization, we work very closely with a lot of companies and helping them on board and really uh, a, a customer success team that um, really gets customers up to speed very, very quickly and where they're producing value as we've shown in some of the metrics that we just showed. And you can see some of the leading cloud native companies that are using Chronosphere, um, you know, DoorDash, Abnormal, just to name a few, um, you know, always have to have the gratuitous logo slide up there, but you can see that these are companies that their applications are their lifeblood and they depend on us to make sure that they're up and running at all times. It's really about observability, it shouldn't just be like this operational toil. It really can be a competitive advantage. And a good example of that is with Robinhood, right? And some of the metrics that they had. So, you know, their mean time to detect improved 4X. The query latency is a huge issue when you start getting into environment. We have a new feature actually that we also launched at KubeCon Query Accelerator, which can, uh, you know, without any intervention, it can look through the environment for queries that are inefficiently written, that are scanning a bunch of data they don't need to scan, and they can use anything that has to use aggregation it can speed up that query. Um, so dashboards load faster, engineers aren't sitting there watching things spin or having it not come back at all and then escalating to a power user again. Um, their query latency improved 8X at Robinhood. Um, they saved to their estimates about $15 million compared to running Prometheus in-house. As I always say, you can't afford free. Open source is free. Um, but the operational headache of trying to manage that environment in-house, um, and we've got a bunch of webinars that drill down deep into that, it can just be a real challenge for your engineering team. And to that, they're not in the business of managing an observability platform. It was much easier for them to move to a SaaS solution and they get more value out of it and saved a ton of money. And probably the most important thing is, uh, which is a remarkable statistic. <clears throat> but if they look at critical incidents like Sev0, Sev1 events, they reduce those by 75%, which is pretty remarkable. 
And with that, Han, if there's any questions that have come through, we'd be happy to take them. Um, the other things I'll just, while we see if there's questions that came through, <clears throat> we'll throw some resources up on the screen here again. So you can actually, you can get a demo of the offering on the, on just go to chronosphere.io. Um, and there's some really good um, eBooks that we also make available. The case studies are on our website as well. All of this information is right available on our website and we encourage you to take a look at it. And if you want to get a demo of the platform, we'd be happy to set that up as well. All right, uh, we do have some questions coming in. We can take them from the top. So the first question, what dashboards are supported in Chronosphere workspace views? So who will pick this one? <clears throat> oh yeah, so the, I said you can curate all your dashboards within workspaces and, collect, and within collections and in workspaces views. So today we actually will support your existing like Grafana dashboards, but also Percy's dashboards. Those are the two that will support um, with the release. And workspaces uh, and collections, uh, we announced this uh, recently it will, um, and it will be available like December 6th, 2022, in case you're watching this webinar in 2023, um, <laughs> then it's already available. <laughs> All right, the next question. If my team is given ownership of the service we did not build, how do we update the collections? Okay, so if you recently are given ownership of a service from some other team, how do you reorganize your collections? Okay, that's a good question. Um, you can simply move the collection that's associated with the service to your team. Um, this is one of the things that we think is pretty cool about the platform. Um, it's not a lot of manual intervention here. So, but you can just move the collection to that team and it will move all the contained artifacts to your team as well. So if you do a good job of curating your collection, um, it, it will really give a team a head start in understanding all the things that are important um, for that particular service. So that's one of the things that was thoughtful about developing this was to make sure that these, the, these things were easy to move because organizations we know change a lot very, very quickly, um, just as ephemeral as a microservice is. <laughs> a lot of times the teams can be almost not ephemeral, but they move around a lot and have different responsibilities as your apps change. And we wanted to make sure that collections would actually can be moved amongst the different teams without a lot of headache. Okay, then uh, there is one more question. What do the setup and the maintenance looks like with Chronosphere? So what does the setup and the maintenance look like in Chronosphere? Um, you actually only need to deploy and maintain the collector instances. Um, everything else, it's a SaaS-based platform. So the only thing you have to worry about is the collectors. Um, your instrumentation is all good. So if, you, if you've already started with Prometheus, um, it's actually quite easy to, to move to the Chronosphere platform. Your instrumentation is all good. So the only thing you're really responsible for is just to deploy and maintain those collectors the data store, dashboards, the software platform, everything else itself is managed by Chronosphere as a, as a SaaS managed service. All right, so um, well, we are waiting for more questions coming in. Uh, I did mention at the beginning that we were going to doing a draw for our uh, for Amazon gift cards. So I will go ahead to quickly just announce the winners. Our first winner is uh, Ainan A. The second winner is uh, Mohammed I. And the third winner is Christopher B. The fourth and the final winner is James S. So congratulations to all our winners. We will be reaching out to you with, through the email with instructions for claiming your gift card. So please keep an eye on in your box. <laughs> and uh, if you don't find the email, please check your spend holder. So if you have any questions, please, please just send the questions through the Q&A tab. Um, otherwise, so far I didn't see any new questions, then we will go into wrap up at this point. So Eric and George, any parting words or anything you'd like to the audience to know before we close out? Thank you so much. You know, thanks for the time and for for hanging out with us this evening in my time zone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. Eric said in the Netherlands, and uh, I'm in the Boston area. But um, 
Yeah, no, thanks everybody for joining. And like I said, as you're evaluating tools, I think that some of the most important things to understand, right, is um, understanding that the world is moving towards open source as we deploy more and more cloud native. And I think there's this tendency to think, I think these packaged APM tools that I'm very, very familiar with are just the way to go because I can deploy it and immediately I get something from it. Over time, the scale issues creep up and we've had this conversation with multiple customers, right? So um, we're not trying to replace those systems. They're still very, very important for your cloud and, and traditional applications for your cloud native. Uh, at a certain point, it, it makes sense to start to come develop, use a, a platform that is specifically designed for cloud native. It's a completely different animal. Um, and it's worth taking a peek at. So we recommend that you do check out the site and we'd be happy to set up a demo and show you this uh, in particular. Other than that, thanks for listening and indulging us and congrats to the winners and their gift cards and hope to see you on the next webinar. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Eric.